Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings 17. We want to just go ahead and move on with this and uh, see what God's got from the Lord for us. How about let's go ahead and stand up for just a bit as I read this. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel. Uh, Israel nine years and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord but not as the kings of Israel that were before him <clears throat> against him came up Shalmaneser uh, king of Assyria and Hosea became his servant and gave him presents and the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea for he had sent messengers to So king of Egypt and brought no presents to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. He's suspecting that there's going to be some kind of a conspiracy, and, and so he's just stopping him from being able to do that. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the uh, the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, Assyria took Samaria, uh, I'm sorry, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statues, uh, statues of the heathen, and uh, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which He had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in their uh, in their all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fence city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places and did uh, the heathen, as did the heathen whom God, the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah, by all the prophets and uh, by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep uh, my commandments and my statutes according to all the law, the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servant the prophets. Notwithstanding that uh, they would not hear, but hearken their ne harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in, in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenants and he, that he made uh, with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vain, uh, vanity and became vain and went after the heathen and were round about them concerning which the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made, gro made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through fire and use divinations and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Let's just go ahead and stop right there. Lord, I pray you bless the reading of your word and uh, guide the uh, message and help us get out of it what we need to tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, it gets us up to speed as we read along the condition that mainly we talk about the northern kingdom 
and how bad it has gotten. And we understand that from the very beginning there's been idol worship and all that that keeps coming back. And now we're getting into some stuff where they're sacrificing to uh, Baal and they're, they're pa- letting their kids pass before Molech and, I mean, and offering them to fire. I mean, it's some really awful stuff. And, you know, here's what you find when wickedness is involved. It talked about how they did stuff in the secret places and all that. Uh, but I heard an, an analogy one time like this. You know, when you see a, a cockroach in the house, like, God forbid, man, I mean, don't, you, don't you hate that? If you see a cockroach in the house, you've got more in there. Pretty much you can guarantee, like, there's more. You know, if you just start uncovering things, you're going to find out it's worse than you want it to be. You worse than you want it I want to admit, that's kind of how sin is. When you find out there's sin, uh, you know, and this is what we find when we read Ezekiel. When uh, he goes in and sees Judah, we're dealing with northern kingdom right now, but later on it's going to be the southern kingdom. And he starts to unwrap, God begins to allow him to see all the wickedness that's going on in there. Same thing, I mean, it, this is just so bizarre that they've got this far. And here they're supposed to be the children of God. They still talk about the Lord. They still claim to have some fear of the Lord, but as a whole, the nations and the kings do not honor the Lord at all. Now, there are still godly people. There are still the priests. You know, you got some of them are on the, uh, in Judah, but they're kind of prophesying against both. Like Isaiah, for instance, if you read Isaiah, he's got prophecies towards both tribes. He's, but he's living, I believe, and prophesying over here, um, starting in the time of Uzziah. And then he goes all the way down to this present time that we're talking about. And then you got like uh, Amos, Jonah, Micah. Uh, Most of these guys were on the northern kingdom. And these are good prophets that are trying to cry out for the people and say, turn back to God. But as we can see in the text here, they don't do it. They're not listening to God's people. They're just doing what they want to do. They're following all the other people. And so ultimately what we read in our text is that God allows, finally, after all the prophecy that it's going to happen and all that, he allows um, them to be carried away and taken into captivity, never to return again. Now, I want to try to talk about this a little bit, but the northern kingdom basically exists no more. And people get kind of freaked out about this. And what about the prophecies about Israel coming back into the land and doing all this? My understanding of this and I know that there are people that disagree, and then uh, I don't know about in here, but I'm just saying, like, I know out there there are a lot of people that disagree. But my understanding of this is that Israel is not going to return again until the millennial kingdom, okay? And it talks about Judah and Israel reuniting again and going into the land. I don't believe that can happen right now. There, it's just, everything is just too intermixed. I mean, it's not even a, the tribes don't even exist anymore. And up in Jesus' day, you basically only got Judah and uh, just a couple other tribes that were, you know, where people were claiming to be able to trace their lineage back. But I really don't think that there's any prophecy that's going to show them coming back. Now, yes, after the southern kingdom goes into captivity at a later point, uh, they do go back into the land with Zerubbabel. There's not really a kingdom. They don't, have the, you know, the Bible says that the, there will be no scepter in the land until Shiloh comes. So when the Lord comes back, uh, there will be a scepter on the kingdom, and David will rule and reign again in his lineage, uh, which is Jesus. So Zerubbabel had to go back into the land so that Jesus would be born and he would die on the cross. And then 70 AD, everything's torn apart. There's no temple anymore. There's no, you know, uh, there's there's no Israel. There's no Judah. And again. There's a difference of opinion. Some people think, no, all this prophecy is saying that this is going to happen again. They're going to be restored. I don't think so. I think it's all, any prophecy about that has to do with the millennial kingdom. When Christ comes back, then all those saints from the past will be obviously coming together uh, in the resurrection, and, uh, and then we'll rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. Okay, but that's not really what this message is about, and it's okay that people don't agree on all that stuff. Okay, But for sure, this is the part where we see that um, the children of Israel on the northern kingdom are now taken into captivity under this uh, Assyrian king. All right, so let's look at here chapter 17, 
and let's go with verse 6, chapter 17, verse 6. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took some, uh, I, gotta, I keep making this same mistake. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and uh, in Habar by the river of Gozan in the cities of the Medes. Now go over to verse 11, chapter 18, verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Hala and in Habar by the river Gozan and in the city of the Medes. Okay, so it's talking about what happened during that time. And then the king of Assyria is going to put all of his people into the land of where, the, where Israel was. And he's going to just replace them with his people. And he's taken all the Israelites out of there. They've just assimilated into Assyria and into all these other, other parts. <clears throat> now, this is something that was prophesied. This end of the northern kingdom had been prophesied again through Isaiah, particularly um, under the rule of, ah of Ahaz. So right around this time, he begins talking about that during the time of Pekah. In fact, let's go ahead and go to Isaiah 7. Remember, Isaiah, he, here's a good man that serves the Lord and, and wants to do right, wants to bring the people back, just like all these other prophets. And so Isaiah 7... Start in verse 8. He says, um, let's see here. Isaiah 7, verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is re reason, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it might not uh, be, that, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim, which is uh, head of Ephraim, is Samaria. Of course, that's the capital of the northern tribe. And the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spake un, uh, again unto Ahaz, saying, "Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above." But Ahaz said, "I will not ask. Neither will I tempt the Lord." Remember this from. Last week we talked about this. So he's uh, refusing. Now last week's message, just to remind you, was what went wrong with Ahaz. Okay, so we had some good kings that loved the Lord. Now Ahaz is also offering his children to fire. And he's worshiping idols and he's doing all this stuff. So we already dealt with him. So Judah is in a bad shape as well. Like pretty much back to the point where... Uh, you know, remember when Ahab and, and John, these are all out of order now, but, uh, or they're not in the right sequence, but I'm saying they're not, anyway, <laughs> they don't match up with this side. Okay, but if you remember, Ahab and Jehoshaphat were kind of teaming up, and so we had some wickedness entered into Judah during this time frame right here. There was a lot of idol worship, veil worship and stuff, uh, and so now we're back to that again. And the, and the southern kingdom is right on the edge. Like God's fixing to destroy them as well. Now, thankfully, the king that we're going to talk about next week, uh, Lord willing, is going to bear, save them some time, and he's going to come back and he's going to do right in the eyes of God. But the northern kingdom does not do that. So the northern kingdom at this point is just uh, assimilated into the land and taken away. Now, they actually end up having one more chance but it's too late, okay? And, and, and it all rests on the preaching of the prophets, the men like Isaiah and such like that. But the people are all already out of the land, so this preaching is to these heathen people that are brought in. So let's go ahead and read that. Go to uh, chapter 7, back to 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, verse... Uh, let's go to 27. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, uh, 
Carry thither one. Okay, I need to back up a little bit. Let's see here. Let's start with verse 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Kutha, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from Sepharavim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their, dwell, of, of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore, they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities, uh, in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore, he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. So you see what's happening is now that the Israelites are gone, it's like, it's like in this time frame, everybody believed um, that, you know, you can go back into Judges and you can go back all through these times. They believed that different nations had gods, and those gods had to do with a particular area you know what I mean, like the God of the mountains, the God of the valleys, and, and wherever, the God of the Jews, the God of the Philistines, and they believed that the gods were just like local, you know, uh, variations of, of different areas. And so now you got these people that are coming into Samaria, and they're going in, they're seeing their religious places and all that, which were already corrupt, uh, but they're seeing all this. And then these lions just come out of nowhere and devour some of them. And they're saying, well, the reason they did this is because we don't understand how these gods operate. We don't know their manners. We don't know what we're supposed to do. And so what happens is king of Assyria, verse 27, says, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of God of the land. This is like a, a final, like one last chance, okay? You can be an evangelist, you can be a missionary, and they're bringing you and you can tell these foreigners, hey, here's why God's not allowing you to prosper and why he's sending lions to devour you because God wants you to fear him and he wants you to do this and to do that. As far as I know, that's what the priests did. They taught them the ways. They said, here's what you're supposed to do. The problem is these are heathens. They have their own gods. They don't care, and so they don't do it. And so this it just ends up being just a corrupt land, uh, that just heathen nation that does, just does whatever they want. In this land, which was supposed to be for God's people, Israel, uh, to inherit and all that, okay, but that now it's just taken over by all these heathens. Now later on, you know, many years later, when the south side goes into Babylonian captivity, you're going to see it's kind of the same situation there. So pretty much all the land that God had promised Israel is just corrupted. And there's just like a very small remnant, small handful of people who are still honoring God. Now, thankfully, like I said, the north, the southern kingdom's not done. They're going to have a little bit of a revival, you could say, and uh, come back to serving the Lord a little bit. But let me just give you two points um, of application that we can make from this story, I should say, from the life of Israel and kind of what we see uh, with God in the Bible when it comes to his people. Because from Genesis to where we are now in the Bible, Israel's had a long history. And we know, because in, in, you know, we've gone through the life of Moses and the life of Joshua, and now we're in the time of the kings, on the, I mean, uh, of the judges, Sunday mornings. And you know what we've found is that God's people, quote unquote, God's people, like obviously not all of them had a heart for God, but they had their ups and downs, mostly downs. <laughs> And God raised somebody, and they would try to lead the people, and it's just like dragging them up to serve the Lord, and, and, and they would just fall right back down. And another leader would rise up and just kind of pull them up, and, and then they would just go back down. And it just, it's, it just seems like, how in the world aren't, weren't these people already destroyed? But here's a couple things to consider. Number one, God is super merciful and long-suffering. I mean, so merciful. So long-suffering. And all we like sheep have gone astray. Okay? Like all of us can relate to some degree our stubbornness, our propensity to fall back into sin and follow the flesh. 
you know, are, you know, who knows what we've been saved from. Maybe people have a life where they continually, you know, ran away from God or whatever the case may be. And the reality is this many thousands of years later, since creation and since God establishing his people and all that, nothing has changed. In, in, in many ways, nothing has changed. People still continue to run away from God, not do what he's asked them to do, people refuse to get saved, come to the saving knowledge of the Lord, and God remains very patient, long-suffering. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter three. <clears throat> this is the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of, cre of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which, now, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay, so here's what he's saying. You know, one day, because of the wickedness of the world, the whole world's going to be destroyed. The whole world is going to be uh, judged. God's wrath's going to be poured out. And so you have, with this nation, this is like the first time that the majority of the tribes of Israel are just going to be wiped off the map. And the blessings of God aren't going to be upon them. But then you have several years later, however many hundreds of years or whatever, the uh, southern kingdom is also going to go into captivity, and obviously a remnant is going to be spared. Jesus is going to come from that tribe, but for the most part, you know, God has just allowed them to be destroyed by their enemy and, and all that. But you know what? Even through all of these, I mean, even just dividing the kingdom, if you think about that, was God's mercy. He could have wiped them out right there, but he said, hey, I'm going to, with Solomon's sin, he could have, but he said, I'm going to divide the kingdom up. I'm going to, you know, have more of a blessing on this side. And, uh, and, and then this side, we, we realize it just becomes a mess. But he still reaches out to Israel. You know, every single king, he's reaching out, and he's giving them a chance, and he's calling to repentance. Over here, you know, same thing. They're messing up, and he's calling to repentance. He's, he's, and so he, he's been so super patient and long-suffering, but the day of their judgment finally comes, as it was prophesied um, back in the days of, of Ahaz. Uh, you know, this, this time's going to come. And... And so he's, he's patient with the northern kingdom, he's patient with the southern kingdom, and he's patient with the whole world up until the last day. When's it going to come? I don't know. God knows. And it's you know, no difference to him if it's a day or, or a thousand years. Like it, it, there's, there's really no difference. God's a patient, long-suffering God, and he's going to wait for as long as, it wait, as long as it takes. But he's not willing that we all should perish. He wants us to come to repentance. And you know, the main application with that is he wants people to get saved. But the truth is, even his people, it's like, hey, I'm giving you another chance. I want you to go out there and do the work. I want you to get people saved. I want you to come back to following me. And so God is so super patient, and he's long-suffering. He was to Israel. He will be to Judah uh, in, in coming lessons. He will be with the world 
patient and long-suffering up until the very end. But the second point to that, the other side of that, I guess you could say, is that even when mankind messes things up, because that's the weird thing about free will, is that he allows us to continue to exercise our free will and to mess up all of his plans, so to speak. But even when we mess things up, he will still have his ultimate will. You know, none of these guys were able to stop Jesus from eventually coming and being born. That was part of God's plan. He's going to come from the tribe of Judah. Like all those things were prophesied, all those things were known. He's going to come, and he's going to pay the price, and he's going to, you know, be a... Uh, the lamb slain, he was the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So nobody could stop that. God's going to intervene. He's going to make sure that his will, his plan is executed ultimately. But there is a lot of factors to his will that he just allows us to kind of make a mess of, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, and so even though we mess things up, he will have his ultimate will. So it's not like you can say, like, well, you know what? Back in Abraham's day, he made a promise to Abraham's seed. And back in Israel's day, he made a promise to the 12 tribes. These will be the land. In Joshua, they go back into the land. He says, all right, this is yours, and this is yours, and this is yours. And they never even inhabit it. It's just like, you know, uh, maybe God didn't keep his promise, or maybe he didn't get what... No, God is still going to fulfill his will, and one day... Those people, the, the, the remnant that remained, that stayed faithful and all that, they will have their part in the final kingdom. Israel, Judah will all be one, all the 12 tribes ruling together. Uh, now we understand, after reading the New Testament, that the disciples will be there ruling over them. We will be ruling, reigning in the kingdom. And, uh, and so God will have his ultimate will, even though it's not like we expect it is. But... In the meantime, boy, does mankind continue to mess things up. And we're so thankful that God is merciful and long-suffering. And, uh, you know, from this point forward in the life of the kings, you could go down the list and see every time that the word Israel is mentioned. And it's always e either reminiscing or talking about Israel like Jacob, you know, the person, the God of Israel, you know, for example. And uh, and otherwise, they're they're no more. They're gone. And all the you know some of them might make it over to Judah. There are some of the tribes I think that that, that uh, assimilate into Judah, but ultimately Judah is all that remains. And so, or the southern tribe is all that w remains. So as we follow the story with the rest of the kings, I guess I'll be able to clear that side out and redo the map, <laughs> the chart a little bit as we continue to go down those. But unfortunately. You know, we're going to have a really, next week, Lord willing, it's going to be a great lesson. We're going to have a, a rebound. We're going to have a guy that actually comes and gets all the wickedness out of the land. Uh, but you already know. You know it's not like it's a surprise anymore. That they're going to fall again. They're going to go into sin. Uh, they're going to go so bad that God's going to say, hey, for these sins, I've got to destroy you. And, uh, and ultimately, they go into Babylonian captivity. But again, this is all in the Bible, just one after another, just showing us that it's going to continue like that up until the final day of, uh, of God's wrath being poured out. As a thief in, in the night, it will come someday. All right, let's pray. Father, we pray for your blessings on the, this sermon and, and on this church. And I know it seems so negative sometimes to think about this, but really, in a manner of speaking, we can look at this and see how positive it is because... Though the world is so wicked and constantly running from you, you're so patient and loving and, and, uh, and long-suffering, Lord, waiting for your people to just turn back to you and waiting for the lost people to get saved and come to you. And I pray that you help us just to redeem the time uh, as believers, help us to, um, to make good use of it, knowing that the time is short and we need to bring people to you and we need to preach your word. And certainly we as Christians need to stay holy and righteous and, and do what's pleasing to you. Pray you just help us do that, Lord. Help us understand your word and understand your will. In Jesus' name, amen.